Welcome to the show. I'm Antisocial. And this is the Antisocial Network. I want to talk to her, but I, my face is up against the wall. Yeah, I think she wants to talk to me, but I'm antisociable. Yeah. In this week's episode, titled Self-Defense is Not a Crime, I'll be telling you the story of my friend and political prisoner, Tia Turner, who was arrested at a protest in Yorba Linda, California on September 26, 2020. Thanks for tuning in. video that's been circulating recently on social media of a police car plowing through a crowd of people in the middle of the road during an illegal street racing event. It was no accident. In the footage, the officer pulls on scene, driving right up to the crowd, and his patrol car is immediately surrounded by onlookers who are cheering, filming with their phones, and pounding on the hood of the car. In the background, you can see the lights from other approaching units. Briefly, the officer tries to reverse slowly, but then instead decides to gun it and accelerate straight through the crowd, striking several people and knocking at least one person to the ground, who is then pinned under the police car and driven over before the cop speeds off and flees the scene. Screaming witnesses are scattered in all directions as people try to make sense of what just happened. The entire incident, from beginning to end, takes less than five seconds. The officer who plowed through a crowd of innocent people on January 23rd in Tacoma, Washington, is named Can Fan, is 58 years old and a near 30-year veteran of the force. After being placed on paid administrative leave, his department made a statement claiming Officer Fan feared for his life. When I saw the video, of course I was horrified because I had just watched someone run over people with their car on purpose. And of course, I was even more irate because it was a police officer who did it, and cops are supposed to protect and serve, and we hold them to a higher standard. But more than anything, I was thinking about my friend Tia Turner, who is currently sitting in jail on a million dollar bail with charges of attempted murder for fleeing in her car from a violent mob who was actually threatening her life. I met Tia Turner in the summer of 2020 through activist work. I'd been participating in demonstrations and protests in my area, and Tia had founded the nonprofit Caravan for Justice. Tia's organization, along with several other local community activists, often planned events in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement in our area. Through participating in several driving protests organized by Caravan for Justice and donating supplies and signs, Tia and I became fast friends. Eventually, Tia rented a rad space that would become a headquarters and hangout spot for local organizers, furnishing the space with couches and artwork from activists and hosting meetings for future action. She was starting to make a name for herself in the movement while working towards enacting real change. On September 26th, 2020, Tia was one of the lead organizers of a peaceful protest in Yorba Linda, California. That same day, Trump supporters decided to show up to antagonize and intimidate BLM demonstrators. Along with about a hundred other BLM activists, Tia and her comrades were outnumbered by Trump counter-protesters by nearly 10 to 1. Initially, both crowds were on separate sides of the street, each practicing their freedom to assemble and protest. Then, the Trump crowd started to cross the street and encroach on the BLM supporters, unmasked and screaming in their faces. Tia, as well as others from the Black Lives Matter crowd, tried pleading with officers on scene to separate the Trump supporters and force them back onto their side of the road, but police refused to assist and continued to let the situation escalate. Determined to run the protesters out of their city, Trump supporters continued to physically intimidate and verbally threaten the BLM activists. The BLM protesters, fearing for their safety, vastly outnumbered by Trump supporters and unassisted by the police, decided to retreat to their cars to leave. The BLM supporters were parked in a business parking lot with one exit. There was only one way to get out. 
Quickly, though, Tia's car was completely surrounded by Trump supporters. Some of them were armed and screaming at her. There's video of this incident from multiple witnesses and vantage points. You can see that the Trumpers have completely surrounded her car, standing in the street, and are blocking her from exiting the parking lot. Many are filming Tia and standing directly in front of and behind of her car, recording her license plate. In the video, you can hear people yelling, Do you think we're going to let you leave? Anyone with common sense, knowing nothing about the events leading up to this moment or either parties involved, can see that her life is in danger and she's being threatened. However, knowing that Tia is a queer black woman alone in a crowd of racist, armed Trump supporters makes it ten times more terrifying, in my opinion. In the midst of escalated racial tension, stoked by a divisive and racist administration, and with increasing violence being perpetrated against black people in America in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement... Tia was right to be terrified. She had already asked police who were present to de-escalate the situation and was ignored. She got in her car to leave and attempt to dial 911. Tia does what anyone would do next. She drives her car the fuck out of there. This entire thing was absolutely avoidable, but not because Tia did anything wrong. Before this happened, she first asked police nearby who were witness to the entire encounter to help. They chose to do nothing. When they don't intervene, she retreats to her car to escape the physical threat of violence and is again forcibly stopped by the same crowd. Now they're yelling that they intend to not let her leave, are screaming, and some of them are armed. What would you do? Would you call 911? Because Tia did that too. At this point, she's already asked for police help, and now she's alone, surrounded by angry people who want her dead. Of course she drove the fuck out of there. She didn't want to die. While escaping the violent mob, Tia struck and knocked down two Trump supporters in self-defense. As soon as Tia began to drive, rather than get out of the way of the moving vehicle, enraged Trumpers smash her back windshield as she escapes for her life. The two individuals received minor injuries and were released from the hospital the same day, but still had the courage to collect on GoFundMes that were promptly started to help with their pain and suffering, or whatever. Meanwhile, Tia was arrested, charged with attempted murder, and given a ludicrously high bail of $1 million. She's facing life. Let's talk about Michael Ray Stepanek, a 45-year-old man from Iowa City. In late August of 2020, he deliberately drove his car through a crowd of BLM demonstrators, injuring a peaceful protester. Stepanek told police that he did it because he thought the group, quote, needed an attitude adjustment. Stepanek spent 76 days in jail and was released with three years probation in early January of 2021. If he stays out of trouble for that length of time, he not only will avoid serving any prison time, but he will have his record expunged of the offense entirely. This is the punishment for a man who admitted that he got a little angry and used his car as a weapon. Not even court-mandated anger management for this fucker? Come on, Iowa! At least when James Alex Fields Jr. intentionally murdered Heather Heyer with his car at a white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, he was sentenced to life in prison for second-degree murder and was also convicted of hate crime charges. It's hard not to wonder if it took the death of a white woman for someone to be brought to justice for this crime. James Alex Fields did not just murder Heather Heyer that day. He also sent 19 other individuals to the hospital, leaving five total in critical condition. When Bogdan Vecherko drove his big rig through a crowd of thousands protesting the murder of George Floyd on Interstate 35 in Minneapolis in May of 2020, he was driving his 18-wheeler at full speed. Fortunately, protesters were able to disperse in time before anyone was seriously injured, some fleeing over the sides of the bridge they were trapped on, others throwing their bicycles into the path of the truck to try and slow it down. Previously that day, police had put up road barricades, blocking traffic and allowing the peaceful demonstration to lawfully assemble. According to security footage, however, the truck was apparently on the road before the barricade was put in place, and everything leading up to the incident indicates the driver Bogdan Vecherko intentionally drove into the crowd. After bringing his truck to a stop, he was swarmed by angry protesters who broke into his cab and beat him up. The only person taken to the hospital that day was the truck driver, who was later released without charges. In early September of 2020, the same month Tia would later be arrested, belligerent drivers, this time in Hollywood, California, speed through crowds of BLM protesters in two separate incidents. Video shows the driver of a blue pickup truck accelerating through a crowd, striking and sending one woman flying several feet, knocking her to the ground before stopping briefly and then fleeing the scene. 
The same night, the driver of a white Prius was also detained for unlawfully driving through a crowd of protesters. From what I could find, investigations are supposedly ongoing, but I don't know if charges were filed against either driver. What is apparent is that people using their car as a means to intimidate and perpetrate violence against peaceful protesters is a terrifying trend that a lot of Trumpers seem to think is a cheat code for committing violence consequence-free. According to an article by Reuters released in June of 2020, there is an alarming number of posts on Facebook making false claims about the legality of driving your car through a crowd of protesters, assuring people that they will be protected if they choose to, quote, run them over, as law professor Glenn Reynolds, known as at Instapundit on Twitter, suggested in a tweet from September of 2016. Before we explore this further, let's take a quick break. Brought to you by artisan baristas kidnapped from the southernmost regions of Seattle and transported to your local Amazon hub locker, one coffee bean is all you need is the answer to all your sustainability, fair trade, expensive coffee habit, why is your spouse leaving you, you probably have codependency issues, problems. One coffee bean is all you need is not a coffee system. There are no wasteful cups to continuously buy. There's no coffee shop lines you have to deal with. Just one single bean. First, just pop that little bad boy right in your kisser. Masticate thoroughly, then relocate bean bits to your freedom press. Use boiling water and press as usual. When finished, relocate damp bean bits to a moist paper towel. Repeat process until your next bean arrives in 364 days. It's that easy! One coffee bean is all you need. Also makes a great mother Day present or Flag Day gift for your boss. Don't forget your gynecologist at Labor Day. Do you like the majesty of a throbbing member? Are you willing but unable? Here at Pegasus Penises, we provide quality strap-ons for the Pegasus with unicorn dreams. Each strap-on is handcrafted and modeled after a real unicorn horn in order to deliver you a unique and enchanting experience. Choose from Mythic Sparkle Fart, My Little Puny, and Dinglehopper's Doppelganger for your pegging pleasure. That's Pegasus Penises for the hornless but horny. Do you sleep till noon, smoke three grams of weed, and then drink two pots of coffee and wonder why you're cranky? Do you sometimes miss the college lifestyle of making $20 last 13 days and searching for coins in the couch cushions? If you like to relive your glory days by binging on gas station 40s and overworking yourself without paying any attention to your basic needs, then food might be right for you. A classic standby, food solves many of life's day-to-day anxieties. Line too long at the ATM? Can't seem to find meaning in your average mundane existence? Have a snack! Adding food to your regular routine might just be the thing you need to keep going in your otherwise depressing and aggravating rat race of a life. Feeling rude, crude, and have a bad attitude? Try food! Available at a store near you. Welcome back. We're still talking about the blatant hypocrisy and double standard when it comes to protecting racists who want to kill for fun using their car, as opposed to protecting marginalized groups from literal hate crimes. Since the murder of Heather Heyer in Charlottesville in 2017, Republicans have pushed legislation in many states that would legalize, or at least make it easier to justify in court, hitting protesters with your car. In 2017 alone, Florida, North Dakota, North Carolina, Rhode Island, Tennessee, and Texas all introduced proposed legislation that would make it easier to get away with hitting people with your car, according to a CNN article published the same year. And in Missouri, right now, in 2021, two lawmakers are backing legislation that would protect drivers if they hit a protester during a demonstration. Adam Schnelting, a Republican state representative from St. Charles, Missouri, has introduced House Bill 56, titled the Fleeing Motorist Protection Act. Schnelting's bill would supposedly help protect people from criminal prosecution should they be trapped in their car by rioters. Representative Schnelting tweeted about his proposed legislation, explaining that if your grandparents are in their car surrounded by threatening rioters, they should not be held accountable if they happen to hit one of those people while fleeing the scene. Incidentally, Schnelting's tweet mentioned nothing about the legislation protecting black queer women fleeing in their car when surrounded by armed Trump supporters, so who knows if it's just for grandparents or what. My point is that this legislation is only being proposed to protect white conservatives who want the right to run their cars into people they don't like. 
Fueled by fear and racism, these people want to believe a narrative in which peaceful protesters are actually militant thugs aiming to attack decent human beings who are just trying to get to work or whatever. The reality is that there is actually a pattern of conservatives doing this. From the countless incidents of angry white men driving into crowds of protesters to the notorious footage of a Trump caravan driving the Biden tour bus out of Texas by literally running people off the road, to misleading posts on social media about the legality of hitting protesters with your car, it's pretty well established that this is not a tactic of the left. Hell, they can't even have a boat parade without sinking a bunch of their own. It only makes sense that they would drive through people with the same reckless abandon. If this legislation goes into law, it should be applied equally and not selectively enforced only to protect white supremacists who want to indiscriminately kill people with their car. It should be used to help people like Tia Turner, who actually was fleeing for her life that day when she was threatened, attacked, and prevented from leaving. In the meantime, case after case arises of yet another person who lost their temper, hit a bunch of people with their car, then got off scot-free. With this track record, you'd think Republicans would feel pretty confident. But hey, they feel entitled and they want permission to kill, so they need a legal defense to do it. Hell, if they could, they'd push for legislation for the right to shoot anyone because they feel like it. A shoot on sight bill, or some shit. HB 1776. Just you wait. I called it. Never say never. 2021 has already brought us Jewish space lasers. Thinking about these states trying to pass lax laws that would enable white supremacists to kill protesters has got to have Kyle Rittenhouse's attorney's wheels turning. Why couldn't you have just used your mom's car, they're probably thinking. I mean, I hate to be so tongue-in-cheek about it, but that's the thing, isn't it? If Kyle Rittenhouse had used a car, he likely would have had just as many wealthy donors willing to step in and pay his bail. Not only is Tia the only black woman in the country being held on charges like this for hitting protesters while fleeing in her car, but she can't get the financial support it seems so many white supremacist perpetrators are able to garner. And it's not like there aren't people willing to financially help Tia. As you may or may not know, you don't have to pay your whole bail amount. In California, you need to post 10% of your bail to be released. Tia's bail is a million dollars, so we need to come up with $100,000. Thing is, We have a bail fund ready to pay Tia's bail today, but Tia is facing charges in both Orange County and L.A. County. The bail fund does not want to put up $100,000 to get her released from the O.C. jail she's currently in, only to be arrested again and held on different erroneous charges relating to her activism. Even if we get her out on bail, she's still facing charges that could land her in prison for life. We need these charges dropped entirely. Although it would be helpful to be able to apply case law using something like the Fleeing Motorist Protection Act, currently being proposed in Missouri, the thing is, what Tia did is already protected under the law. It's called self-defense. Self-defense is not a crime. It's defined by the law as the use of reasonable force to protect oneself or members of the family from bodily harm from the attack of an aggressor if the defender has reason to believe they are in danger. The day Tia Turner accidentally struck two people she justifiably feared for her life. She acted the way any reasonable person would have if faced with the same situation. Many from the Trump crowd had posted online using racial slurs and saying they wanted to hunt the protesters leading up to the Yorba Linda event. If anyone had premeditation that day, it was the crowd that had surrounded Tia's car. Right-wing supremacists have slandered Tia's name, stating that she deliberately ran into a crowd of Trump supporters that day. The party who always want to discount video evidence and scream hypotheticals like, you don't know what happened before the video at footage of George Floyd, are the same people clipping the video footage of Tia out of context with titles like, BLM vehicle drives into Trump supporters. The whole truth was that this was a planned Black Lives Matter protest. Trump supporters showed up to counter protest and decided to make the event no longer peaceful by crossing the street and physically threatening and intimidating BLM demonstrators. Then, when they retreat and get in their cars to leave, the Trump supporters refuse to allow them to, surrounding their cars and shouting violent epithets. I don't want to hear references to Tia's past, or see any more videos weaponized by the right in order to slander and degrade Tia's character. It's bullshit. Not when white supremacists are routinely committing acts of violence against black people in this country and getting away with it. 
There have been no less than 10 unexplained hangings ruled suicides that have happened in the United States since the murder of George Floyd. Police brutality is systematically defended, denied, and erased, and I just covered several accounts in the past year of white supremacists deliberately hitting people with their cars out of anger. Nobody's talking about the domestic violence record of Ashley Babbitt, the disillusioned traitor who stormed our capital and was shot in the neck. When George Floyd was murdered, police and Thin Blue Line supporters thought it was hilarious to wear shirts that said, I can breathe, and to circulate memes about how funny it was that George Floyd was calling out for his mother while he lay dying in the street. Who can't breathe now, Ashley Babbitt? Some people want to portray Tia as a vengeful and violent person. It is not lost on me that the cliche of painting her into the angry lesbian slash angry black woman box is just too easy for so many people that are used to justifying their hatred and bigotry with convenient narratives and sweeping generalizations. To them, she is not a person. She's a violent Antifa angry feminist personified. But I know she's more than that. She's a fighter, a survivor, and a crusader for justice. She's the same woman who paid me to make BLM signs when I was broke and who smoked a blunt with me at the outdoor roller disco. She's the strong woman who launched a nonprofit in the middle of a civil rights revolution, rented a space, and created a home for so many local activists. And Tia's my friend. If you want to help Tia or learn more about her story, you can visit freetia2020.com and follow me on Instagram at the Antisocial Network for real time updates on her case and calls to action. More than anything, we, Tia's friends, would like you to share this story, post about her on your socials, and use the hashtag FreeTia. If you'd like to donate to her commissary fund or bail fund, you can find links to do so on her website, FreeTia2020.com. Thanks so much for listening. That's my show. I'm Antisocial, and this is the Antisocial Network. This episode was sponsored by One Coffee Bean Is All You Need, Pegasus Penises, and Food! If you like what you heard, please subscribe to my podcast and leave a review in iTunes. I'll be back next Wednesday. Later. But I'm into sociable, yeah.